Hi, I'm Keith Lackner. I just want to take a couple minutes to show you guys all the little tricks and tips that I have to make my one-of-a-kind pieces. We're going to start from the very beginning of prepping all the way to product selection to how to use a pressure pot and actually in the end we're going to show you a little bit of turning and how to get your, uh, your pieces to look like this. These beautiful one-of-a-kind pieces that I sell in my galleries. So stay tuned. So let's start out with product selection. I know when you go to Lumilite's webpage, there's, you could get overwhelmed very easily with all the different products that they have. But for me, there's really only one product that I use from them, and that is the Lumilite Clear Slow when it comes to casting my pieces. Um, there's a Lumilite Clear and a Lumilite Clear Slow. And the big difference is the Clear Slow gives me the, the open time that I need to be able to cast my larger pieces. Mix all that resin together, get it in the pressure pot, get it under pressure in time. If I was to use the regular Clear, it would start to set up before I even had a chance to get it in the pressure pot. So for me, I use the Alumalite Clear Slow. Um, the great thing about the Clear Slow for me is that it works on large pieces as well as the smaller pieces. And the large pieces are probably about 90% of my, uh, my turnings that I do. This way I don't get accidentally confused and grab the wrong product and actually start mixing it up. So just to show you some of the things that you could cast with the Alumalite Clear Slow, um, this is just a regular piece of handle stock. I'm gonna turn uh, some turning tools with this. Um, we've got this one, and then you can go a little bit bigger. A uh, nice little double um, burl piece that I have here. It's got a beautiful uh, casting in the center with some uh, ocean blue is the color from Illumilite. Then you can go all the way up to these uh, pine cone linen boxes. I've been doing these for a while now. I absolutely love them. Um, they're really neat to be able to use uh, pine cones. You can start casting a little bit larger. Uh, right here I have a burial urn that I'm going to be casting. I uh, Actually I did cast. That's going to be uh, turned out of mesquite as you can see here. I just want to take a couple seconds and actually show you the actual largest thing that I've ever cast with a Lumilite Clear Slow. This product right here that I use every single day the, just the limitations are endless. The only thing that you're limited by is your imagination. So wait till you see this piece. Now this is the largest piece that I've ever casted. Um, frankly, I did it just to see if I could do it. Um, I call this piece Grasshopper, um, just to give it a little bit of scale. This right here probably used about two cups or probably about 600 grams of resin, somewhere around there. Now this big piece here, I cast it as one solid piece using the Illumilite Clear Slow, and it took uh, about four gallons. So I, pour, I whipped up four gallons in a five gallon bucket, poured it into uh, my mold. I casted this all as one full piece instead of multiple pieces. So this way the colors, they just kind of flow into one another from the top cap to the bottom cap. I didn't want to have a separation at all. But um, it was all casted in one big shot with a Lumilite Clear Slow. So just to show you that really you're not limited at all in, to uh, casting anything that you want to cast. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about, we're going to break this up into three different categories. And I call them the three golden rules of casting with a Lumilite Clear or a Lumilite Regular. Um, it's going to be, the three golden rules to me are your, um, your preparation, your product, and then your pressure. If you follow these three rules, um, you will be able to have successful casting. If you start messing around with getting a little lazy and skipping over one or not doing a couple as good as you should, then you're gonna start seeing failures. You're gonna start seeing bubbles. You'll start seeing cracks. You'll start seeing a lot of things that really frustrate a lot of people that are out there that are casting. But if you follow these simple rules, it's gonna make casting a whole lot easier for you. So stay tuned. So the first golden rule is actually preparation. Um, this is where a lot of people get it wrong. The most important thing is actually what's all done behind the scenes. This is where people, they get it wrong because they get a little lazy and they don't want to go through all of these steps to actually prep their wood and prep whatever they're going to cast. They just want to jump right into casting. And that's where a lot of people, I think, uh, really screw up and then they're done with a failure at the end. So a lot of the times we're going to ask you, if you come to us and ask us, you know, hey, I've got bubbles or I've got this, we're gonna ask you pretty much these simple questions. And one of the most complicated questions is, did you stabilize? I know that's a question that gets asked a lot and there's a lot of uh, little controversy behind it, do you or don't you? And the answer is very simple, it's yes. Um, uh, 
Yes, yes, you stabilize. Yes, you don't stabilize. Um, for me, it's I've had enough experience to where I know which woods you don't stabilize and which woods that you, you have to. Every single time, you have to stabilize these woods. Um, a good example is I have right here, I've got this beautiful piece of Buckeye Burl. Um, it still has a lot of the bark on it, so this is nowhere near ready to go um, into a, a, a mold for casting, okay? So one thing about Buckeye Burl, it's got a beautiful grain to it, but it's really punky, it's really spongy, it's really soft. Um, this is not good for just straight casting, okay? We need to stabilize this, it needs to get hard, okay? Another piece I have here is a Maple Burl. Uh, maple burls are really good uh, wood to cast on. I cast a lot of maple burl. Um, you do have to stabilize it um, just for the simple fact that sometimes uh, maple burls and burls what I really cast on, um, they've got a lot of uh, spalting, um, a lot of little decay soft spots in there. Um, a lot of things that you know you, you need to stabilize. You need to make it hard. Now, a good example of what not to stabilize is I've got this piece here and uh, there's a piece of uh, mesquite burl. So on each side of here, I've got a mesquite cap and then I've got the resin running right down the center, okay? These do not need to be stabilized. So um, the reason why is these are very, very hard, dense, dense wood. Very hard, um, they won't move on you really. So what your goal is, is you're trying to take this real punky piece of wood and turning it into this right here. So you're trying to bring this to the same um, hardness as this. So you're not gonna try and take this and bring it to another level. I mean, I guess you can, but you're really just wasting uh, stabilizing resin. So again, just to recap, there's certain woods that I always um, stabilize. Definitely Buckeye, um, any spalting woods, any woods that are punky, anything that have uh, any type of decay that you are trying to save. Maple burls, uh, probably about 80% of the time I cast maple burls. Um, I have had some success uh, casting uh, large maple burls just for the simple fact that I don't have a pot big enough to be able to put them in. So I know I stay away from um, burls that are um, any type of spalting whatsoever. Um, if it's spalting, I'll cut it up into little pieces and then uh, cast them. Uh, for example, like this, this came off of a very large piece that had a lot of spalting in it. And uh, I just knew I was going to have a failure, so I cut them up into little pieces that I would turn into handles like this. Um, so woods that I never ever stabilize are um, mesquite, uh, eucalyptus burls, um, really anything from Australia. All the Australia burls that you see out there that everyone's advertising, those things are hard as a con as a slab of concrete trying to turn those. So you have absolutely no need to ever want to try and stabilize it. And then there's another one that is. Uh, Kind of fond of me is uh, pine cones. I absolutely love turning pine cones, these lidded bo uh, pine cone boxes. I think you get a really intricate, great pattern with these. Um, I stabilize my pine cones. I know some people will say that they don't. Um, you know, I've done them both ways. I've stabilized them and not stabilized them. Uh, one of the things that I have found is that I feel that the pine cone itself holds together better when I'm turning them. They're not just breaking off and splitting. Because just remember, I mean, the resin itself is extremely hard and durable. Uh, the weakest point is going to be the weakest thing that you cast in here. So for me, it just made sense for me just to uh, stabilize them and actually make the pine cone itself a lot stronger. So once you have your burl or whatever you're going to cast on, uh, one of the things that's very important is that, like I said, this piece right here, it is not ready to go. It's got bark that's on there. It's got, you know, dirt that's on there. So, I mean, you need to get in there and you need to remove all of this. You don't want nothing in between uh, your resin and the burl or whatever it's going to adhere to because bark's just going to come off. So, you don't want to all of a sudden start seeing a big separation because you, you're not uh, have the resin adhering to the wood itself. It's adhering to bark. And then when you're done after that, just take a wire brush. Hold on a second, got one right here. We're just gonna take a wire brush and just get in there and just clean it. Clean it really good. Just get in there and make sure you get all the dirt and everything out of there. Now this piece here is actually ready to start the drying process. Now, I wanna talk a few minutes about the drying process because this is kind of where everyone gets it wrong in the beginning. Um, when you go to your local uh, supplier, wood supplier, you'll ask them if the wood is, is dry and they're gonna say yes or they're gonna say no. 
one thing that they don't understand is that resin casting is still kind of new. When I started doing this, there was really nobody that was doing it. So um, I tr every single piece that I got was wet. Now it's to the point where when you start getting it, there's people out there that know resin casters and they will save pieces like this to the side and they'll sell them to you in boxes. Uh, so it's a great way to save some money on casting. But um, getting back to it, so you gotta prep this wood. So you go in there, you ask them if the wood is dry, they're gonna say yes. Well, industry standard is about eight to 12% is considered dry material. Anything over that is what they call green or wet material. For casting, that's way too wet. Um, we need to get this thing all the way down to almost 0%. Um, I know a lot of people are saying that's not possible, but it actually it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these pieces, we're gonna put them in an oven. We're gonna set the oven at 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what that does is we are actually eight degrees Fahrenheit over the boiling point of water. So any water that's in here is gonna evaporate out. Now, the only thing I can't tell you unfortunately is how long to leave them in there. Um, a piece like this, I would leave in probably just overnight. I throw them in my oven, leave it overnight, come out the next day, get ready to cast. Uh, the big piece grasshopper that I showed you earlier, um, I actually had it in the oven for about three and a half days just to make sure. Um, I didn't want to take any chances with it. It was a very expensive piece. Um, so I, I just didn't want to take any chances. So I went uh, to the extreme to make sure that, that thing was dry. Um, one of the things is, is if you're doing this for the first time and you're going to stabilize it, that's when you take it out and you start the stabilizing process. You, you inject the resin into the, the wood and you go through whatever practice you need to for, uh, to stabilize your wood. Um, if you go straight from the oven and cast, like I did with this piece, it came, went straight in the oven, came out, went into the mold and I casted it right away. Um, it's very important to remember that you gotta cast it right away. You can't take all the moisture out, take it, throw it in your shop, put it on the shelf for about three or four days and then go to cast it. What's gonna happen? Well, your wood is like a sponge. It's gonna start pulling all of that uh, humidity that's in the air and it's gonna bring it back. And within a day, you're gonna be right back up to 12%. So if you're not gonna cast right away, one thing that I do is I take them and I wrap them up in uh, plastic wrap, cellophane. Uh, just wrap it all up good and tight and then make sure that you set it to the side and can make sure you cast it within a couple of days. Um, normally, I don't start the whole drying process unless I'm ready to cast, but I understand you know life comes up. So if something happens and you, you can't cast right away, take it out of the oven, wrap it in plastic wrap so no moisture, no humidity can touch it, no air, and then you're, you're fine to cast. Um, one thing that I do though is right before I go to cast it, I'll take it, pop it back in the oven at 220 degrees, just for maybe an hour while I'm starting to prep everything up, get it up, set it in the mold, and then I cast on it on that. Okay, so now that we got everything prepped and ready to go, we've got our wood that's got zero moisture in it. Um, we've got our molds ready. Um, let's talk about the second part of the golden rule, and that's product. Um, like I said, I use Alumalite Clear Slow, and because I cast really large, um, you, you need one of these to mix it all up with. Right here. Um, you know, just to go to show you, I mean, basically every single time that I cast, I've got a gallon bucket that I pour my resin into. Um, you've got only probably about 10 to 12 minutes before it needs to be in the pot. To make sure that you get this thing uh, whipped up thoroughly, you have to use uh, one of these. This is just something that I had uh, welded, a uh, buddy of mine welds, so you can see it's seen some, uh, seen some casting. Um, it's just a piece of 3 8 rod with a little paddle on the end. You can commercially buy little tiny uh, paddles now that you put in your resin, you mix it up. And I know what you're thinking, you know, maybe, hey, I've gotten, I've gotten bubbles in the past. It had to been because I mixed it up too fast. Bubbles do not, do not come from over mixing. That's just an urban legend that started in the very beginning. People really didn't understand what was going on. Um, bubbles come from two things, and we'll talk about that later in a little troubleshooting video. Um, but in order to get your product thoroughly mixed, a large bucket, you have to use a power mixer. I'm sorry, you're just, you're not gonna get it in time. You gotta mix it up, you gotta add your different colors, mix your colors in, and uh, you're just, you're not gonna make it. So you have to have, this is an essential tool that you have to have. So let's talk about the product um, and weighing it up. Yes, Alumalite Clear needs to be weighed. When you first receive it in the mail, put the two side by side, or you buy it in a store, 
put the two side by side. As you can see, the B, there's actually gonna be a little bit less B than there is gonna be A. That's because by volume, the B weighs more than the A. But as you're weighing it out, when you get down to the bottom, you're gonna notice that you're gonna run out at the same time. Alumalite needs to be weighed. You can't go by volume. So with that being said, um, one thing that I do is I've got a kitchen scale. I mean, they're, they're cheap. They're like 35 bucks. Uh, I mean, no need to go out and get a huge digital scale that, you know, that's very professional. Um, you know, just, I think I paid $30 for this at the uh, local store down the street. Um, make sure it has gram weights. For me, gram weight is the most important thing. Um, I measure everything out in gram weight. And the reason I do that is because if I'm weighing, say, a thousand grams, of A and a thousand grams of B and I put a thousand and five grams of A and a thousand grams of B, I hit that thing right on the head. That five grams is nothing. It's, it's not gonna throw your, your blend off. It's not gonna make it gooey. It's not gonna make it cure longer than it should. Um, it's just, it's the tighter tolerance uh, that you use to measure, you could actually be off and it not be as bad. If you start weighing in ounces and pounds, you know, if you're like a half a pound off, that's huge. That you're you're probably going to have issues later on trying to demold it. So for me, the only way to do it is to measure everything off in gram weight. Now let's move on to the third golden rule of casting with alumalite, and that is a pressure pot. You absolutely 100% have to have a pressure pot. Um, pressure is needed to actually pulverize the bubbles. A lot of people ask, do you use vacuum or do you use uh, pressure. The easiest way that I always tell people is that you use vacuum when you stabilize, you use pressure when you cast. Uh, basically you're using the, uh, the pressure as like an atmospheric clamp that's pushing down on that resin and it's pulverizing all those bubbles. It makes it so that the bubbles are just so small that you cannot see them with the naked eye. So pressure pots are uh, very much important. Um, just make sure that I cannot stress this enough. Please, please, please make sure that you never exceed the certified working pressure of your pressure pot. If you don't know what it is, don't use it. Don't cast with it, don't, um, don't use it. Um, all the pressure pots, they should come with a recommended uh, maximum working pressure. My pressure pot's got 90. I have got a very large uh, pressure pot that I also have that's certified up to 110. I personally cast at 80 pounds. But if you're going to use, if you are going to cast pieces like this, you're perfectly fine casting around the 60 to 40 uh, PSI, PSI range. Um, large pieces like, like this piece, you know, if this is your goal that you want to do, um, unfortunately you won't be able to achieve success using a pot that you could only get up to about 40 to 60 pounds. Uh, you're going to have to dump the money in and buy a, a pressure pot that actually is certified for 90 and above. So in closing, let's make sure that we review the three golden rules of casting. Number one, make sure that we prep our material. We get all the moisture out of it, we have it nice and clean, we have no dust, dirt, or bark that's on our wood if that's what we're casting. Number two is make sure that we have um, the resin properly weighed and mixed. That, those are the two most important things is make sure that it's nice and dry and the resin is properly mixed. And then the third most important thing is just make sure that we have it in a pressure pot. We have it in the pot in a good amount of time so that the pressure could actually do its job and pulverize all those bubbles before it starts to set up. If you follow those three golden rules, you'll be able to turn one of a kind pieces and actually cast one of a kind pieces like this. So hope you enjoyed these videos and happy casting.